what I would say is we average um, about two patients a day that come off of the ventilator uh -huh. uh, that are survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the numbers are over 100 that have come off the, the ventilator since um, the end of March. Okay, Daniel Jackson, CEO of Sinai Grace Hospital. Welcome to One Detroit. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for sitting down with us. So uh, your hospital sits uh, right in the middle of the 48235 zip code, which we've learned over the last few weeks is really the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak here in the city of Detroit. Uh, that zip code has more cases. Um, it has a higher rate of infection than, than other parts of the city. And of course, there are more deaths. I just want you to spend a little time uh, talking to our viewers about what that has meant for your hospital, what things have been like in this hospital uh, over the last seven or eight weeks. Right. For our hospital has meant multiple things. I think first and foremost, it's the continuation of our commitment to taking care of the community. Um, pre and post COVID, Sinai Grace Hospital has been here for over a hundred years serving this community. So part of it is continuing to serve in that capacity. In terms of specifically how we have been impacted by the surge associated with COVID-19, it has at times been overwhelming in terms of the volume of patients that we've seen and the number of challenges that we've had to work to to remain steadfast in that commitment to the community. And there's a myriad of things on a regular basis that goes into a hospital functioning well. All of those particular functions are stressed when you have as much capacity in such a protracted amount of time as we have seen and experienced. Yeah, um, there have been stories about the extraordinary lengths that you've had to go to because capacity-wise, uh, this just overwhelmed, this just overwhelmed the hospital. Um, talk about some of the things you've had to do in terms of just meeting the needs as they come through your doors every day. I think there are two components that are very significant. One is trying to be as proactive as possible in terms of planning, um, given the experience of other locations, whether it be um, in Asia, in New York, in Washington State, and trying to apply those things. And then you have the real world experience of what happens when it is actually your place where it's taking um, place at that moment. And so a combination of planning, uh, preparing, and then being able to pivot in the moment. And as we saw things evolve and change, um, quite literally, sometimes from hour to hour in terms of best practices or recommendations, we've had to try to remain nimble to do that. So whether it is supplies, the availability of supplies, or commandeering human capital resources, um, you've had other parts of the country that have had similar instances and those uh, resources are drawn and then become scarce if you're not in the place where that first wave takes place, right? So, for example, here um, in the U.S., New York was a hot spot and remains a hot spot. And so there's a, a, a drawing of resources that goes to New York that then also creates a, a more difficult um, opportunity for other locations such as Detroit or California or Washington State. And so you have to work through those things. We've also benefited, though, however, from our sister hospitals here in Detroit who were able to um, reallocate resources that were able to support us as well. Then also being a part of Tenant Healthcare, having resources come from other parts of the country um, where there are hospitals and people available that may not have been going through the same thing. So we're very thankful in both instances to be able to um, partner with others. Yeah. Uh, give us a sense of place there in 48235. Um, it's in northwest Detroit. It is not the poorest part of uh, the city by far. It's one of the densely, more densely populated parts of the city, though. Uh, the population there, uh, talk about why, in your view, uh, the, the effects of the coronavirus are so profound for those folks, and those are the folks who I think are showing up in, in, in such large numbers at your doors. 
Right. One of the things is the density of population in, in our primary zip codes, but also the starting point, if you will, in terms of health status. We have a number of people that have pre, uh, pre-existing conditions, um, whether it be high blood pressure, um, kidney disease, um, obesity. Um, some of these pre-existing conditions exacerbate the impact of COVID-19. And there's a high prevalence of some of those um, conditions in our community. That coupled with also, we have a high concentration of nursing homes um, in our community as well. The significance of that is that those um, patients, while convalescent, um, do not move much, but also they may be compromised in terms of dementia um, or other um, maladies that prevent them from communicating where they are and their status. Mm-hmm. So in most of those instances, when those patients present here at the hospital, um, their disease process is further along. They're much more critical. Um, and because of just the sheer volume, there's a higher concentration of those patients that we were able uh, to treat. But I would also say in the context of that, um, a lot of success as well in terms of treating. Um, through Thursday, we've discharged over 650 patients of home. And so why it is very tragic and some, some outcomes, there's been a lot of um, healing that has taken place as well. Um, I, I wonder if you can talk a little about um, uh, how prepared you feel like we were in Detroit and Detroit hospitals uh, to, to deal with this, this, uh, this pandemic and the, the, the profound needs that, that have cropped up. Uh, Sinai Grace is part of the Detroit Medical Center um, and connected to, to the other hospitals in the DMC, obviously. Uh, was, was the overwhelming part of this uh, partially about lack of uh, supplies, lack of resources that existed long before this? Um, I don't think so. Um, my experience would be that we were prepared and preparing However, I think, um, not I think I know, um, we are a generation, this is the first pandemic in over a hundred years. And so I don't think that's the type of thing um, that you can fathom. There are lessons you learn um, in the midst of, and we're no different than other entities in having learned those lessons. Um, as you progress through the crisis, you become more adept and how to do that. Um, on the front end, I would say some of the things I will refer to as the wave. Hmm. Um, so you had other places that were already drawing resources, whether it be supplies of people, that again, you're trying to pivot and anticipate where that would take place. Um, I think we, like other hospital systems in Detroit, um, experienced that in a fashion that was unpredictable. Um, and so in the moment, you do the best you can and you learn um, as you go. Mm-hmm. And I, I cannot speak highly enough of our um, practitioners and healthcare providers who had the courage and the dedication to do just that. Yeah. So, so I, I want to ask you about your staff as well. Uh, we've seen and heard lots of stories about nurses and doctors and other staff there and, and what they've experienced uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, are you worried, I guess, about, about the toll this is taking on that staff, not just uh, physically, but, but the mental strain of, uh, you know, of, of so much treatment, of so much uh, illness and death, all compacted into such a tight time frame? Um, you know, I, I wonder if uh, nurses, for instance, uh, will be able to, to keep doing the job that they're doing at Sinai Grace uh, into the future. Right. Um, I would not use the word worry, but I would use the word we acknowledge the impact, the cumulative effect, mm-hmm. and understand that we put measures in place to try to minimize that. Can you eliminate it? Absolutely not. Uh, just the sheer impact of doing this and going through this day after day Um, would impact anyone. And so again, I referenced the courage and dedication that the staff members have had. And then we as an organization 
try to make sure we make every possible step um, and resource available to support them in that. And sometimes that includes saying, you need to step away. It is prudent to step away um, so that you can recharge and come back again ready to take care um, of the community. Do you feel like uh, the support systems, I guess, for that staff are in place to be able to, to keep them, you know, uh, keep them going through all of this? And then, of, of course, on the backside of this, to keep them treating the population there. I do think the support system is in place, but also we acknowledge that there are varying degrees of support that's required. And so understanding the scalability of that and how you support that, um, and again, being very much aware and acknowledge that and in tune and creating forums where people can voice um, where they are. And sometimes it may be um, unbeknownst to a provider where they are. So tr you have to try to have um, some eye to discernment around evaluating that, um, having support available, and then also having multiple layers of, of support available so that we can revert and, and step away. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, understanding that it is a continued stretch of um, being extended beyond normal capacity. Right. It's taxing. Right. Uh, I, and I want to come back to this question of, of the effect, not just on your staff, but, but on that community. Um, you, you said earlier that you've had more than 600 people discharged uh, after being greeted with COVID, but the numbers, the death numbers, um, I wonder if you can talk about what those have been and then talk about um, the emotional impact of this uh, in, in that hospital and in this community. This is not something we're accustomed to dealing with. Uh, and it is uh, so intense and it happens so fast. Uh, I wonder if you can give us a sense again of, of what this has been like. What I would say is um, magnitude in terms of we know that um, death is a part of the life cycle. And we take pride in the fact that we, at our very best, are a place of healing. And so in every instance, there is a component that is somewhat um, disheartening um, in that, that, that continuum. And so in uh, pandemic, you feel and experience that component more often um, than you would desire. And so the resilience of working through that, uh, the joy of seeing the next patient come off the, the ventilator, mm -hmm. those things are the drivers in terms of um, what keeps people motivated. Um, there's nothing um, remotely um, uh, more intrinsic in terms of what happens for the staff that could go through that day after day, again, that for an extended amount of time. Um, there's a lot of joy um, and growth that comes from the team um, making a difference, if you will. And, and that is very evident when you see how people care um, for the patients and the impact of what it means to them personally as well, because outside of the, the people that you take care of, this also can extend into your personal life as well. So it's, it's, it's a very um, multifactorial perspective. Uh, but again, um, you cannot praise our providers enough in having the fortitude to work through that. Mm. And, and again, can you compare uh, the numbers of released patients to the number of, of deaths just so we get a sense of, of what you're dealing with? What I would say is we average um, about two patients a day that come off of the ventilator mm -hmm. uh, that are survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the numbers are over 100 that have come off the, the ventilator since um, the end of March, uh, which is astounding. Yeah. Um, don't have the exact numbers on um, those patients who have succumbed mm -hmm. um, to COVID-19, um, but but they are more than you would rather have happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about going forward? Uh, what, what should change? What could change? Uh, not just at Sinai, Grace, but in the wider health system in the city and in the country as a result of having had to, to manage something like this? 
Um, as a healthcare system, we're still learning. As a world, we're still learning. Um, there are a lot of unknowns about COVID-19 and um, a lot of modeling that's taking place about what's the appropriate protocol to treat, um, what are the long-term effects, what as we try to find solutions um, to battle this. Uh, I think there's some things that are very important of what we know now. Um, the value of social distancing, we know that now. The value of hand hygiene, we know that now. The idea of trying in communities and beyond to make sure that we make testing available um, so we know the status of those around us and, and the effectiveness of our other efforts um, in that fight on, on COVID. So I think continuing to educate ourselves, um, to be vigilant about those standards and adhering to those standards, being compliant, um, and uh, that dialogue continuing for the good of the community and others. I'm being very cautious as we try to evaluate what are the next steps. I, I think one of the things that's most important um, as we enter this, this next phase, if you will, of things that uh, people experience that are not COVID related that still need to be treated, right? We have an inordinate amount of people um, out of fear or concern, choose not to seek health care um, and are not being treated as they could or should when those resources are available. So helping people to know to reach out to your primary care physician. Um, if there's a, an emergent uh, need that you know how to access um, health care and understanding that it is safe to do so. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.